The Progress of the Civil War. This is part two of our review. And we're going to look at the Civil War itself this time. The southern states leave the Union. They refuse, they just absolutely refuse, to recognize Lincoln as President of the United States. You remember? We didn't vote for him because, obviously, he wasn't on the ballot in the South. And they're going to protect the institution of slavery at whatever cost, they say. <clears throat> and when the opportunity comes to compromise with the North over this issue of slavery again, the South simply refuses. Now, how can we say that the cause for the southern states leaving the Union was slavery? Well, let's look at the evidence first. The first piece of evidence is every one of the southern states' proclamations of succession, and that means proclamations saying they're leaving the Union, every single one of them says that slavery is the reason that they're going to leave the Union. The second piece of information is something called the Cornerstone Speech. It's given by Alexander H. Stevens, the Vice President of the Confederate States of America, and he's talking about both the Confederate States of America and its Constitution, and he says that it was necessary for the Confederate States of America to be created because it was necessary to write a new Constitution and fix the horrible mistakes in the U.S. Constitution. And those horrible respect, mistakes were, number one, not guaranteeing slavery forever and not stating in the U.S. Constitution that blacks are inferior to whites and not deserving of equal rights. So, two pieces of evidence there. All the proclamations of succession and Alexander H. Stevens' cornerstone speech. They are strong evidence that slavery was the reason for succession and that slavery was the reason for the Civil War. Yes, states' rights is discussed. And the southern states like to say today that they left to protect states' rights. But states' rights are just uh, an idea that John C. Calhoun created to guarantee slavery forever in the South. Because under his idea of states' rights, the states could do what they wanted. The federal government could never really tell a state what to do. So any state could say, we're going to be a slave state, and the U.S. government could never say, no, you can't. So it's just a way for the South to come up with something to say, well, uh, when they were members of the Union, you can't pay, pass, pass laws limiting slavery, and then to say when they went, well, okay, you know, we're going because you're violating our state's rights, which we would use to protect slavery. Now, both sides of the Civil War were convinced that they would win, and that they would win rather quickly. But let's look at each side as it goes in. You know, your little paper said that you wanted to look at the advantages and disadvantages of the North and the South. So let's start with the South. The advantages of the South, the South had the very best army officers. Most army officers, and especially generals, came from the South because the second son in every, almost every plantation family went into the army and he became an officer. He wasn't going to be some guy trudging around on foot with a rifle. Fighting for homes and families and plantations gave them a great boost in morale. I mean, they were really into this war. Uh, they were also fighting a defensive war. And the side that fights a defensive war can succeed with fewer people. And the South does indeed have fewer people than the North. The people in the South know the land in the South best, and Southerners had a lot more experience with guns and horses 
than people in the north who lived in cities and didn't ride around the countryside and, and shoot all the time. But the North also had advantages. It had almost all the factories. The North controlled the Navy. The people who were in the Navy, whether they were sailors or officers, were almost always Northerners. The North had a much larger population from which to get its soldiers, so it could possibly have a larger army. And the North had almost all the money. I mean, money was something that was not in great abundance in the South. It was a lot of cotton, but not a lot of money. Okay? And you had to sell the cotton abroad and buy something abroad and bring it back. So the North had the money. It had the factories with which to make the things and spend the money on it. And then look at the last one. It had the railroads to move around everything that it spent the money on and to move troops from one place to another. What were the disadvantages in the South? Well, we just talked about it there a little bit. Little or no money, and there were only two or three factories in the South, period. It had to import its weapons. It just If you don't have factories, you don't have arsenals to make weapons. So all the weapons that the, that the Confederate soldiers used had to come in from somewhere in Europe. They had to buy them there and ship them back to the South and then provide them to the Army. But the problem was that the South could be blockaded by the Union Navy. It was very difficult for ships to get in and bring anything in, whether it was weapons or anything else. In the South... The non-plantation mountain boys, the people who lived in the mountains of eastern Tennessee and the mountainous region in the northern part of Mississippi, they hated conscription. And they weren't keen about fighting the Civil War. And so they had a lot of trouble getting these people to be soldiers. And finally, the government and the president of the government in the South Jefferson Davis, were weak. They just couldn't get things done because they really couldn't give orders to people to do things. The North had difficulties, too. It had generals, but they weren't terribly good, and they were without drive. And by that, I mean, when they got on the battlefield, they weren't really out there to fight hard. A lot of the Northern generals... Uh, just didn't follow up if they won. They didn't chase the, the Confederate armies and try to really destroy them. Oh, I won the battle. Good enough. And they stopped rather than chasing the Confederates and finish off, finishing off the Confederate army. The soldiers were not always dedicated. The northern soldiers were not always clear what they were fighting were, for. <clears throat> were they fighting to keep the southern states from leaving the Union, or were they fighting to end slavery, or were they fighting for something else? The southerners knew what they were fighting for, to keep slavery. The northerners, they weren't so sure. Southern lands were unknown territory, and a lot of them in certain places were mountainous, so it's very hard for northern troops to know where they were and what they were doing. Conscription was used in the North, but it was hated. In New York, it caused a riot, and in some other places, it caused riots. And people could weasel their way out of conscription. And not all Northerners, period, were convinced that there was a need for the war. There was a group of Northerners, which grew over time as the war continued, that basically said, oh, forget it. Just drop the war and let the Southern states go their own way. We'd be glad to be rid of them anyway. What was the North's war plan? It was called the Anaconda Plan, and it was, it was developed by General Scott. And here you see a map that tries to explain it. Like a great big anaconda snake, it was going to surround the Confederate States of America and slowly squeeze it to death. Uh, the snake would just come in and in and in. It would go north from the Gulf. It would go east from out there in the, in the western part of the United States. And from the east coast, it would move in to 
like uh, the middle of Tennessee and the middle of Kentucky, say, and the Confederates would just be squashed, okay? Surrounding the Confederate States of America, it would cut it off from the world in Europe. It would allow it to also slice it in pieces because one of the first things as the snake began to contract, they would do is they would go down the Mississippi River and cut the Confederate States of America in two, a western half and an eastern half. And that way, they wouldn't be able to help each other. So here you see it. You might want to pause it and look at all the bullet points here that talk about how this anaconda plan is going to work. So take a few minutes, pause it, read it, think about it, maybe make a note or two on it, and then you can click and start the video moving on. Because here are the important points about what the Anaconda plan, the, the Union's plan for the war, was going to do. The South's plan was different. The South's plan was really pretty basic. Rush out there and quickly meet Union armies. Beat them as bad as you can. And by doing that, convince the North that the best thing to do was just to recognize the independence of the Confederate States of America. There wasn't any great plan to invade the North and take over the North or anything like that. The South knew it would be lucky if it could just keep the North out of the South. But the idea of how to keep it out was to meet Union armies as quickly as you could on the field, find them, meet them, beat them. Find them, meet them, beat them. And by doing that again and again, you would convince the North to recognize the Confederate States of America as a new country. For the first two years, Southern armies did great out there in the field. They usually met and defeated Union, office, Union armies, although not always beat them badly. And by the end of two years, the South really appears on its way to becoming an independent country. In Europe, lots of countries are thinking about recognizing the Confederate States of America. But then, along comes a northern offensive. The North suddenly makes military progress. Union armies appear outside the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia. It looks like they're going to take it. But General McClellan, the commander of many of the Union Army offensives, was a super cautious man, usually managed to snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. In other words, when he should have won, he managed to lose. And this is exactly what he did here. He lost, Lee pushed those Union armies back from the Confederate capital, back, back, back. And in fact, Lee pushes them so far back that he decides that he will attack the biggest of the Union armies, the Army of the Potomac. He's going to attack the Army of the Potomac, he's going to beat it, and he's not going to stop this time, he's going to invade the North. Lee moves into the state of Maryland, and there, at Antietam, or Sharpsburg, depending on whether you're a Northerner or a Southerner, the Northerners named their battles after the nearest body of water, and here it was Antietam Creek. The Southerners named it after the nearest town or village, and that was Sharpsburg. So the Battle of Antietam, here in Maryland, Lee wants to bring damage and devastation to the northern lands after he's beat the Union Army. But he also wants to do one more thing. He wants to have a great victory and to destroy Union lands so that the vote that's coming up in just about a month to elect members of Congress, some senators in the entire House of Representatives. He wants the peace Democrats in the North 
to win that vote because the peace Democrats will then say to President Lincoln, settle this war now. And if Lincoln doesn't do it, they'll cut off the money to support the army and keep the war going. But things don't work out the way Lee had planned. This is basically a one-day battle. One day, 60,000 men are killed. The Union Army stops Lee's advance. It's General McClellan again. But he stops Lee. And when Lee finally says, I've taken too many deaths amongst my troops, I cannot try to push on anymore, and retreats, McClellan does what he always do, does and failed to chase Lee and polish off his army of northern Virginia. So Lee fails, the Union wins, but Lee escapes to fight another day. However, everybody in the North proclaims it a great victory, a great victory, and Lincoln uses it as an opportunity to do his Emancipation Proclamation. He's been wanting to issue this for a long time, but people in his cabinet have been saying, no, 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 if you issue it, you're going to look desperate. So Lee has been wa uh, Lincoln has been waiting for a time when his northern Union armies could actually win something of significance on the battlefield. And when that happens, he issues the Emancipation Proclamation, what it says is that all slaves in territories still under the control of the Confederate armies and the Confederate government are free. Lee's purpose, the, Lee has had to retreat. Lincoln thinks that he can create more problems for Lee by issuing this and giving slaves the opportunity to rebel. Meanwhile, back in Britain, the English Prime Minister, the British Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston has said, ah, the Union has won a big victory. Uh, I decide uh, we're not going to recognize the Confederate States of America. And if Britain won't recognize the Confederate States of America, France won't. And if France won't, the rest of Europe won't. So, Antietam resulted in the Confederate States of America not being recognized as a real country by any European power. Big blow to the Confederate States. Meanwhile, the Union Navy seizes the city of New Orleans, and the city of New Orleans is down near the place where the Mississippi River empties into the Gulf of Mexico. By seizing New Orleans, the Union gains control of much of Louisiana, and part of the Confederate States of America is automatically occupied by the Union. At the same time, Union armies move down the Mississippi River from Illinois, from Cairo, Illinois, at the tip of Illinois on the Mississippi River, Union armies move south along the Mississippi River on riverboats, and they fight a series of battles to take control of the entire river. The two important battles are the Battle of Shiloh and the Second Battle of Vicksburg. And when the Union armies get control of the entire river, they cut the Confederate States of America in half, an eastern half and a western half. Remember, that was part of the Anaconda Plan. And here you can see, up here in blue, it says General Grant, and he's at Cairo, Illinois, and he's coming down the river, and down at the bottom, you can see Commodore from the, from the, uh, from the Navy, and this Commodore is moving naval forces in here to take New Orleans. And so now everything that's on the western bank of the 
Mississippi River is cut off from everything that's on the eastern bank of the Mississippi River. So Mississippi is cut off from Louisiana, and it, that also isolates Texas. This means things aren't going so well. And in fact, they're going very badly for the Confederacy by now. Lee decides to invade the North a second time. And there's a reason for invading the North. People in Virginia, the population in Virginia, is dying of starvation. And Lee's soldiers are out of guns, ammunition, money, and most of all, they too need food. So Lee is going to go north into the place where he knows the most food in the United States is to be found. The southeastern part of Pennsylvania. And when he gets there, he's going to try to strip Pennsylvania bare. Take everything that's there, burn everything that's there down so they can't grow more food. Take all the animals, all the crops, back to Virginia to feed his army and the people that live in Virginia. This is what Lee is trying to do as he advances up into Pennsylvania. It goes well for a little bit, and he gets a little bit of food and a few animals, but not nearly enough to make any difference because his army comes up against a big Union army at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And here, Lee's starving army is ultimately roundly defeated by the Union Army. It's a big battle, and a lot of people are killed. Not as many as at Antietam, but it's a big battle, and many people are killed. But Lee's army just doesn't have what it takes to win. And in the end, all Lee can do is pack up and go back to Virginia, and he hasn't really succeeded in getting anything. So his army is now in horrible shape when it returns to Virginia. Lincoln moves General Grant, who was commanding that war that went down the Mississippi, he moves him to the east and tells Grant to take control of the Army of the Potomac to invade Virginia and to wipe out Lee and his army. And Grant does that. Now, we talked about the Anaconda Plan. That's part of the Union strategy to win the war. But at the end of the war, they needed something more than this Anaconda Plan to win. Grant and his generals come up with what they call total war. Up to this time, either a Confederate army or a, or a Union army has been trying to meet the other army on the field, defeat it, maybe even eliminate it from existence. Now, now the purpose of the Union army will be to meet beat and destroy every Confederate army that it comes in contact with. And that means kill so many and wound so many Confederate soldiers that the army will no longer function. And then they adopt what Lee was going to do in southern Pennsylvania, and they say not only are we going to defeat the Confederate armies, Everywhere we defeat the Confederate armies and drive them backwards, we're going to destroy all the fields, all the plantations, all the cities, all the railroads. We are going to burn every single thing there is to the ground. And two of General Grant's generals that worked for him, that were under him, put this into effect. One was General Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman. And we see it in what's called Sherman's March to the Sea. Sherman starts inland at the edge of Tennessee, and he begins to move across Georgia. 
until he gets to the sea. And as he moves this whole distance, his army spreads out over a distance of 20 miles. The column moving forward is 20 miles wide. And along that 20-mile path, it destroys everything in its path. As the Confederate armies are driven, driven back, the Union soldiers move forward. They, get, they either kill or chase everybody who's living there away. They kill all the animals. They burn all the farms to the ground. They tear up the railroads and destroy them. After they passed over them, they don't. They get to move forward on them first. And then after they move forward, they rip the railroads up, so the Union can, so the Confederates could never use them again. And they use their cannon and blow everything to pieces. And this process is repeated again by another general named Phil Sheridan. He goes down what's called the Shenandoah Valley which is the western part of Virginia where it comes up against what's West Virginia today. There's a valley there uh, between sets of mountains. And it's a nice region. It grows a lot of food. And Sherman's troops march down, uh, I mean Sheridan's troops march down the Shenandoah Valley and they destroy everything from one side of the valley to the other, the whole length of the valley. Supposedly, Sheridan said to his generals or his colonels, leave nothing standing for as far as the crow can fly. And that region, the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, was totally destroyed. Every building was burned to the ground. Under these conditions, with Virginia starving and moving closer to complete famine because of Grant's total war, Lee has really no choice but to surrender. He still got some of his army intact. He could still continue to fight, but he would just lose battle after battle, and his men would just starve and starve and starve and be less and less able to fight. So Lee does what he thinks is best for his men, and he surrenders to General Grant. And when Lee's army surrenders, that's the biggest army in the Confederacy. The capital of the Confederacy falls, the biggest army in the Confederacy has surrendered. All the rest of the armies very quickly surrender to other Union generals, and the war is over. Here you see Lee surrendering to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. <clears throat> 